thank you for that kind introduction. I, I normally use a very long bio, so that it means by the time I'm introduced, I don't have to talk for very long. But uh, we have an hour or so today, so, so we've got plenty of time. Um, can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, um, uh, elders past and present, and also thank the Quail family very much for the opportunity to, to speak at, at uh, such a prestigious event. Um, inevitably, my mum is here, and inevitably, my mum has discovered there's a very strong family history connection between the Quail family and ours, having been in Warndu, and I grew up in a place called Lake Bolak, hi Colin, um, which is about 15 kilometres from Warndu. So, uh, five years ago, I worked overseas, and every presentation I gave, I had to explain where Melbourne was, let alone where Geelong was, let alone where the Barwon region was. And here I can say the words Lake Bolak and half of the room probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'd also like to acknowledge the strategic alliance and, and I hope you all noticed that I made a deliberate strategic error just to explain my strategic sensitivities by bringing a two-year-old and a five-year-old here. <laughs> um, and I thought that was quite a clever strategic move in terms of just, you know, uh, disrupting things a little bit, but they're probably off having something not obesogenic. So, I'm hoping to speak for around about 45 minutes and really what I'm planning to do is to talk quite a lot about chronic disease and I'll really locate that specifically in obesity uh, in the work that this group has done over the last 10 years, particularly in collaboration with the main agencies in this region. Um, and I should stress at the outset that a lot of what I'm going to talk about I wasn't involved in but this group was and indeed a lot of the people in the room are responsible for some of the successes I'll talk about. I'll then talk about where that's led us in terms of the work we're doing now and where we see that going in the future. Um, so in the first instance, I'm going to talk about the nature of the problem. And, and the other way of kind of describing that is the chicken little section of the presentation, because it really is the doom and gloom part of this. It really is the sky is falling in, the world is ending, goodness, we've got no hope. Uh, and then we'll move on to a slightly more hopeful and happy topic. I'll talk briefly about the causes, but equally, obesity is a really interesting condition and chronic diseases that stem from that are interesting conditions because if I asked you what caused the problem, you'd all be able to tell me. And in fact, if I asked this room for a list of the things that cause obesity, I'd probably get the top 30 causes straight away. The issue we have is not what is causing the problem, it's what we do about it. Um, and that's something I want you to bear in mind. I'll talk about possible solutions, the work we've done, the current work that we're doing, um, and we just recently, today we met for our Centre of Research Excellence, Excellence in Policy Research on Obesity and Food Systems, even I can't say it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means and, and the difficulties that we're facing in getting that work done because this is such an intractable problem and then where next. So a large part of what I'm going to talk about really relies back on this very basic framework of the causes of chronic disease. So at the right hand side of this picture are the main chronic diseases. These are the ones we've all heard about. These are the ones that are the main problems facing developed countries like our own and growing very rapidly in low and middle income countries. Heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory disease and diabetes. And we all know the risk factors for those. Hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, overweight and obesity. And we understand those relationships really well. We've got at worst, 30 years of very good epidemiology and at best, 100 years of epidemiology. It's usually me. <laughs> um, so this is a nice reminder maybe to turn the phone on to silent <laughs> or sit on it really quickly. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the relationships between these risks and how we're thinking about tackling those. But I think this kind of puts it in, in very nice perspective. This is um, the US Surgeon General on their way out of office. I think this was in 2010. And I'm just going to check mine, just in case. And um, <laughs> this might be a nice chant. Yeah, good. Um, and what they said is, as we look to the future and where childhood obesity will be in 20 years, it is every bit as threatening to us as the terrorist threat we face today. Now, if you think about the way the global discourse has shifted since 2001 and the seriousness with which uh, the US and the rest of the world has had to tackle the threat of terrorism, and they see obesity as a much greater threat. That's the level of size of scope of problem we're really dealing with. So we literally can shut down borders if we have a terrorist threat, and yet we, um, the US Surgeon General sees this as a bigger problem. A different way of putting that in this report, they said the thing we're most worried about is that if the US was attacked, we don't have enough fit people to um, create an army to defend us. We can't find enough people to put in uniform who would be fit enough to serve. So 
we don't have brilliant data in Australia about the size of and scope of the problem over long periods of time, so I'm going to show you three slides. So these are US data, and the US have really quite fantastic monitoring data over this period of time. Uh, this is 1986, and this just shows prevalence data for the US. So this is sort of ground zero, if you like. Half of, half of the US wasn't even worried about whether they had a weight problem or not. They weren't measuring, which is what the blank means. Light blue and um, the sort of aqua there are, are, well, it's somewhere between 1 in 10 and 1 in 8 of the population are obese. And remember, obesity brings with it um, a major reduction in life expectancy, i.e. somewhere between 10 and 15 years, and massive healthcare costs in terms of comorbidities. If we advance um, some seven years, you can see a big shift in terms of much better availability of data, no blank squares but also quite a few more coloured squares in terms of the light blue, um, which is the 10 to 14%. And then the group that comes next is, is I think it's 10 to 15%. Let me have a look up here. 15 to 20%. So we already need a new category within seven years that we didn't even think was relevant seven years earlier. If we advance again to 2010, we need several new categories, including the dark red, which relates to one third or more of the population being obese. So over a 30-year period, you've gone from a situation where it's less than 1 in 10 to over 1 in 3 being obese. And I don't mean overweight and obese, I mean obese. So that's definite, no question, um, strong relationships between the condition and health-related problems and costs and disability and suffering. But there's probably a better way of explaining this than that. So you're going to see these pictures again, and you're going to see that time frame again. But what I'm going to do is show them to you in a sort of continuous build. So you'll see how this problem has emerged over this period of time, and it has a kind of explanatory soundtrack. So let's see how we go here. So when we look at this picture of this emerging epidemic with the students that we work with, we ask the question about, well, does this happen all over the place at the same time or does it emerge in different places? And what are the causes and what are the reasons for that? And what you can see is there's a very clear geographical patterning in the emergence of this condition across the US. It happens largely um, in the south and the east and then it spreads out across that country. If that was an epidemic that had arrived like SARS and had have spread over a weekend, they would have shut the borders. The only difference is that it happened over a 30 year period of time. And so it's the same sort of spread, it's the same level of a health issue and yet we can't seem to turn it around. Our Australian data aren't as good nor as the time trend data is good, but this gives you an idea of the situation we face. So this is overweight and obese down the bottom here. Some are around two thirds of males and more than half of females are overweight and obese. What that means if you're working in prevention or if you're working in health, is that you're dealing with a condition that is normal. So you're not dealing with a condition where it affects um, a few people. It's actually more than likely the people you're dealing with are overweight and obese, which means a message that says, look, this being overweight and obese is really bad for you. It's an unusual condition. You really need to do something about it is a very hard one to receive because if I look around, I look like everybody else. I don't see myself as being in an, an unusual or unhealthy state. And I think this is really important for those of us who grew up in Lake Bolac or Warn Do or Portland where I'm going the day after tomorrow or Camperdown where I'm tomorrow. This is obesity rates for women in Australia, but um, it tells a picture really that's pretty standard all over the place. Around about a quarter of women are obese. If you're in the lowest, so this is the, the average line across here. If you're in the lowest SES, lowest socioeconomic status group, i.e. the poorest, you're far more likely to be obese. Same if you live in remote areas or, uh, or the inner city, and same if you're indigenous. So this is not an equitable disease either. There are large inequalities in the distribution of this disease. So let's talk briefly about the causes. So where does this come from? So this is the same data that I've showed you of, of the emergence of this disease over time, but this time I'm giving you lines for different age groups. So you have 
Um, let's see, the bottom one here is 20 to 34 year olds, I think, and here you've got a 55 to 64 year olds, and all age groups in between. Across the bottom here, 1950 through to 2010, and proportion of obese. Again, US data, but the patterns, I promise you, are the same in Australia. We just don't have as good a data. The, what's the obvious thing that stands out here? What's the clear and obvious pattern? What can you see? Beg your pardon? It's on the increase. It's on the increase. You've got a really massive increase. And, and those of you who are epidemiologists know that that looks like the start of the perfect epidemiology, epi, um, epidemic curve, where you get a rough little bump and then it drops and then it just absolutely takes off. The second thing to say about this picture is that it's happening in all age groups at the same time. So this doesn't just affect the young or it doesn't just affect the old or it doesn't just affect one particular group. It happens across all age groups at the same time. One of the implications of that is it's likely that it's an environmental cause that affects the whole population at the same time. So the question you ask is, what is it that happened somewhere around the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s that has driven this epidemic in all levels of the community? So this is a really interesting question. Uh, the, our, the professor in our centre, Boyd Swinburne, did quite a bit of work thinking about this and trying to tease out what this was about, and this is what he did. So this is the availability of energy in the US food system per person over the same period of time. So it's quite complicated. I actually say 20th century we're looking at here. So this is, if we think about all the food that's produced, how much energy is actually available per person. So it's adjusted for how many people there are. <coughs> and you can see we get a little bit of a dip in energy availability during the Depression and during the wars, and then a real reduction here around the Cold War and, and um, the energy crisis. And then look what happens at about the same time that the obesity epidemic takes off. Energy availability does exactly the same thing. You get this massive skyrocketing in terms of obesity prevalence. Um, when you look at that in terms of the contribution to obesity at population level, it more than explains the epidemic. So when you adjust for physical activity and when you adjust for food waste and you take all the things into account that you should, this explains that pattern in the obesity epidemic that we saw before. And one of the explanations that we're playing with and we think is fairly strong is that there's a push phase. In other words, all of this energy, it was we'd, have to, we'd work all day and we'd go and find energy and get it in response to a need. We've moved to a situation where when we're, um, whatever's happening to us, energy is being pushed onto us. So if I drive home tonight, between here and home, it's a 25 minute drive, and I could probably buy um, th three or four different uh, value meals for around about five or six dollars without ever getting out of my car. Very, very simple and very easy, and it's being pushed on me. So this is sort of what Boyd says, the only plausible explanation for this increase is the food supply. Um, there's a different way of putting this perhaps. And um, this is just the way that New York sees this. I'm just going to see if I can turn this volume down a bit. Let's see how this goes. So I maybe should have given you a warning about not having dinner <laughs> before you came. But equally, a large, uh, we think a large part of the drivers of this is the food system, and in particular, added sugar um, and, and added fats in the diet. Um, and New York is a very interesting case study because they're trying to tackle this problem head on. So that ad is one from New York City. The, the New York City Health Department created that ad, and then they took it to the TV companies, and the TV companies said, there is no way we are going to run that ad because their major advertisers are the soft drink companies. So uh, one of their staff accidentally let it out on the internet. Uh, it went viral. <laughs> and you can now see it sitting here in Geelong. And in fact, it's, it's gone worldwide and people have seen it all around the world. And I think um, it's even being used in advertising campaigns in other countries, including Australia. So if we move to possible solutions, I want to talk very briefly about some of the work that's been done in Bow and Southwest, um, and, and it really has been partnership work. But I also want to talk about other places that have got wonderful solutions to this problem. So there is one country on the planet that solved the obesity crisis. Does anybody know where it is? My staff do, but they're being too polite. Thank you. <laughs> it's very kind. 
The one place on earth that's actually solved the obesity crisis is Cuba. I'm going to show you a very complicated picture of that, but let me, let me see how this looks. So there's a lot going on here, but these are looking familiar now. You've got obesity prevalence here, and the critical one is this blue one here. This is obesity prevalence from 1980 to 2010. Can you see that? So what happened, something happened in 1990 that's caused a massive reduction in obesity prevalence. Something happened in 1995 where it started um, kicking off again. And basically that time point is the withdrawal of Russian support and the US embargo on Cuban trade. So what happened was the Cubans upset um, the US and the US said if anybody trades with Cuba, we don't trade with them. So in Cuba you couldn't import any cars, you couldn't import any food, you couldn't import any any paint or anything, and it led to that change. And here is when they started relaxing their, their trade restrictions and when they started allowing US dollars to be used. The other really interesting thing to, to see here is when you look at it in comparison to um, CHD mortality, you get a lag here, but you get a corresponding dip in mortality within a period of about five to 10 years. So when we talk about this being an intractable problem that takes 30 years to create, that can't be turned around, that's too complex, not true. You need a recession or a nuclear arms race or a world war to do it. But countries have done it. It has been done. It has been done. And it's been done because the change is at a societal and a structural level. And even better, if you can create the change, you do get a concomitant reduction in mortality and morbidity. And that's what this says. But that's at a nation level. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what happens at, a, at a, a very local level. And these are three studies that happen in this region. One in Colac called Beactive Eat Well. One in East Geelong called It's Your Move. And one in Greater Geelong called um, Romp and Chomp. Um, Colin Bell, who's here at the moment, was involved in how many of these, Colin? All, some, all of them? And Mel as well. So th this was before my time, but it's, it's very nice to have people still working in the team and coming back to the team who've been in, involved in these seminal studies. And when we look at this, um, these studies ran in the 2000s and, and the, the vertical bars here are essentially points of measurement where measures were done. But the critical part of these studies was the design of them was to work with the communities and ask them um, what it was that was possible in terms of intervention given the way that that community worked. So the academics brought an evidence base about what was possible, what caused the problem and a process, but the communities designed the interventions. Um, that makes sense now, and there's plenty that's been written since, but at the time it was a fairly radical way of thinking, I think it's fair to say. Um, terrible, horrible, ugly picture. It's, the only, it's a logic model for this, and, and it's the only one of two complicated ones I'll show you. A couple of things to note. The target here is behaviours to change anthropometry, which just means BMI, which just means weight status. The target then was environments and individual knowledge, attitudes and belief. Another thing that made this quite different for its time was it targeted policy and changes in community capacity. So the dose, the thing on the spoon, the magic ingredient, was increasing the capacity of the community to respond to the problem. It makes sense and, it, and it, it sits alongside the stuff that the Alliance is trying to do and has been trying to do for a long time, but for its time was quite a radical idea. One of the critiques of this in, in, with a retrospectoscope is that this is a linear logic model. And by that I mean it goes from A to B to C to D, which is Fabulous because it's easy to understand and I'll show you why that's a good idea in a moment. These studies also ran in Fiji and Tonga and, and New Zealand. I won't show you the results from there but um, when I show you that it worked in this country, it didn't work in the others. So these are the three studies and the critical parts of the bit in red. In under fives, there's between a 2 and 3% re relative reduction in obesity prevalence over a three-year period. Nowhere else on earth had been able to create something like that. In Be Active, Eat Well, a reduction in waist circumference and um, body weight relative to controls. And probably the most surprising is in Geelong, a 6% difference in ob obesity prevalence over the study period in adolescents. So I was an adolescent once, I've got friends who are adolescents and so on. Asking them to do anything, let alone behave themselves and, and have healthy behaviours, is almost impossible to achieve. But by getting adolescents to help design this, they actually got some success. The critical thing with this is when you analyse the data and there's, there's enough data there to see it happening, there isn't a single behaviour that caused the positive change. In fact, what you see is there's a, an increase in activity, there's an increase in healthy food, there's a decrease in junk food, but not significant changes. And this shows this a different way. So this just shows capacity change across the bottom. Each of these are, are groups of kids in schools. 
If it's hollow, it means there are a, um, a comparison school, so no intervention. If it's a solid block, it means it's an intervention school. If it's above the line, the obesity problem, the overweight and obesity got worse. If it's below the line, it got better. So what you can see is as capacity increased, the effect size of the intervention increased as well. So what you can see is there's a relationship between increasing community capacity to respond to this problem, capacity meaning um, working with the partner agencies, working with the communities, and the level of response that you get. Pretty amazing um, world-leading stuff that a uh, number of people in this room, but also Boyd led. If we talk about our current weight then, we're, we're starting from a pretty basic starting point, and that is that the concern here is energy balance. So remember I talked a moment ago about the relationship between shifts in food intake and, and energy in the food system and individual and population obesity. So simply put, if we take in more energy than we spend, we're likely to put on weight. If we spend more energy than we take in, we're likely to lose weight. Very simple. From that starting point, the world's experts got together and said, well, it might be a touch more complicated than that. Perhaps we should spend a bit of time just thinking about what else is related to this um, particular problem. So a committee was formed. The world experts converged on London, then Madrid, then Barcelona, then um, a few other nice places. <laughs> they created a discussion document. They discussed. They did a quite a bit more work, spent quite a bit more money, and they came up with a simplified picture of the causes of, the energy of this energy balance equation. And this is their simplified version of, of this problem. So this has got several names. We'll call it the foresight map, but you might have thought of one for yourself already, I suspect, that, that others who use this have used as well. It's also called the spaghetti map and a number of other things. It's useful for a couple of reasons. As an academic, I put that up there and I say, gosh, it's terribly complicated. And if you don't have our help, really, there's no chance. Um, so it, it makes us look good, because look how complicated we can make it look. The second thing it does is it shows that the, the causes aren't linear. So when you look at this, there isn't a single linear relationship. It's, each of these different things are related to each other. So there's food systems, individual psychology, and so on and so on. And the third thing it did for us was, if the successful interventions primarily rely on increasing community capacity, and that community capacity has to be done at a local level and has to be um, sensitive to how that community is structured, a top-down model like this is nearly pointless because it, it da can't respond to the local context. But it does tell you you need to understand the complexity in the local context to be able to design the intervention properly so that it will work. So the challenge we're faced with is using a map like this, and this is called a systems map, but creating one of these that is meaningful in places like Geelong, Colac, um, Wyndham, Whittlesea, and so on and so on and so on. And so that's, that's the work we're doing at the moment is trying to get to the point where we have a process to draw and understand these types of systems to help drive interventions. Um, so I'll talk very briefly about what I mean by systems, but essentially the whole world got to the point where they realised this was a complex problem and where they realised that single interventions didn't work and they said, right, we've got to have a whole of system response. That's the way forward, go for it. And when you look at the literature from around about 2005 to 2010 and you see all of these uh, Institute of Medicine, World Health Organization, National Cancer Institutes, um, the CDC in America, all say what we really need now is a whole of system approach to obesity prevention and a whole of system approach to understanding the causes of chronic disease and responding to them. They all talk in theory and not one of them does something practical in terms of how you actually go about doing that. So they can draw beautiful systems maps, but they can't actually use that with a community to design an intervention. So that's, that's the challenge we face. And just to give an idea of what I'm on about by systems, it's as simple as a set of elements that are connected that achieve something. And I, I think about a school system is teachers and classrooms and buses and curriculum that are, is designed to ensure kids do what they're told, that they don't get expelled, and that hopefully they turn up between about 8.30 and 3.30. But more important than that, it's not just those parts of the system, it's the way that they're connected and the way that those connections work and how those things differ between different environments. A different way of putting that, if we think of the right-hand side of that line, if, if I woke up this morning and, and fell over, got dizzy, fell over in the shower, called an ambulance, someone would come, uh, we'd call triple O, someone would come and get me in, in the ambulance. The person who triaged me would have five to ten years' worth of training. They'd have all the latest 
um, equipment in their ambulance and they'd take me to the emergency room where I'd be treated by someone who had a huge amount of experience backed by an enormous amount of research uh, with treatment plans with a whole bunch of really wonderful well-established science backing them up in terms of what was the right way to treat me based on my symptoms. If we look to the left-hand side of that red line, we don't have anything as organised as that to deal with those risk factors for chronic disease. So we have a brilliant treatment system. If I have high blood pressure, there's pharmaceutical trials tell me which pharmaceutical I could take and it's just a question if I take it. If I have an unhealthy diet, we don't have a systems level response, a whole of system response that can help me solve that. We have individual and piecemeal things. So what does that actually mean in local communities and what does that mean in terms of um, inequities? So this is a picture of some of the work that we've been doing. This particular picture is in Whittlesea, but we've been working all around Victoria uh, in the ACT and also in a number of countries overseas to work with local communities to get them to map what's important in their system. So this is, these are pictures of this work happening um, and it takes a long time. It's workshop type stuff. We spend a lot of time thinking about the relationships between different risks and the outcome, understanding those relationships and then beginning to quantify them and understand the ways in which they interact and the ways in which they change how things work. More important than that, we then give those communities the capacity to develop an intervention based on their system. So when we did our interventions 10 years ago, they ran beautifully and they worked and as soon as the money went away, they stopped. So as soon as there was no funding for staff, they stopped. The idea here is to embed the intervention in the system so that it happens regardless of whether there's an enormous amount of funding or very little. And I'll just give an example of what's happening not just in Geelong but all around Victoria, which really genuinely is leading the world in, in this particular um, endeavour. So the Australian National Preventative Health Agency have invested somewhere in the region of $900 million over seven years, sorry, six years, particularly to tackle obesity. And they've done the right thing and they've followed the evidence base, which is to do multi-level, multi-strategy, multi-sectoral approaches. So they've, they've understood the need to tackle complexity. And $870 million to tackle food and physical activity to prevent obesity is an outrageous amount of money for prevention. And it's less than we spend on one statin in one year. So when we think about the, the right-hand end of that causes of chronic disease that we were talking about a moment ago and just what that costs, and we think about what we might be able to achieve with prevention, actually the prevention spend is really quite low. Um, but nevertheless, this is a massive boost for prevention. And one of the things that Victoria's done is, is done something genuinely world-leading and the rest of the world is watching what people um, in Geelong and other places are doing to take a whole of systems approach. So they've said, let's use this money to try and create a prevention system. How do we create a system for prevention rather than just run activities and events and programs like we've always done? Um, and so that's what they're doing. And I'll just talk very briefly about this. And I, I need to acknowledge the Department of Health here who've provided the, the next several slides. And also to say that there's a co-creation model here between policy, practice and research. So we're all involved in helping um, shape this thing and, and in helping the department move it along, but it's definitely being driven from within the department. So this is, I think, one of their most complicated slides, and it just shows the levels and the areas at which this particular intervention is working. So it's working in children's settings, in workplaces, in communities and statewide, and right across that whole picture, there's levels of activity at all of those different levels. Each community is responding to the opportunities to create prevention based on what suits their local context. So it's responsive in terms of what's right in their local community. Um, in Geelong, this is it's called Healthy Together Geelong, which many people will probably know of and, and have engaged with and um, is starting to make real and genuine progress. And so there are 14 local government areas where this is happening in an intensive way and then it's happening across the whole state. Um, and you're talking about nearly 1,000 early childhood centres, 500 schools, 4,500 workplaces and more than um, 1.3 million Victorians. So more than a quarter of the population are expected to be influenced by this intervention. Um, and in, in addition to that, there's a system being created for prevention that, that hasn't existed before. So we do quite a bit of work with some of these communities in helping them think in systems. and. and it's a difficult thing to do because nobody's done it before. Nobody's solved this problem before and, and this is the challenge they're facing. 
And this just shows some of the um, work that they've been doing and some of the reach they've got. So they're now already in a quarter of primary schools, um, in almost half communities, in a huge number of early childhood centres, and so on and so on. And in fact, a lot of the lessons that we learnt here and have learnt in other places have informed the design of, of this intervention, but, but it's far more than just that. So where next with this work? Well, this is, this is probably another really important picture to point out. This is data um, between Australia and WA, but this is representative data for, for Australian populations. And it essentially shows the um, comparative contribution to burden of disease made up of premature mortality um, and years of life lost due to being disabled due to illness. Um, they're the two things it's made up of. What it shows for tobacco, it used to take up 10% of all um, burden of disease was attributable to tobacco as a risk. And that's dropped down to somewhere in the region of 6% over a 10 year period. And it went from number one to number three. That's a fantastic public health success story. That's an amazing success. That's a massive turnaround. But equally, when you see what's happened in terms of high BMI as a risk factor, it's gone from number three to number one in the same period of time. So while we're winning a battle against tobacco, and in fact, beyond green packaging, and the, the only thing left to do is really ban it altogether, I don't think there's any, any very much further we can go in terms of tobacco prevention and control, that, that battle's nearly been fought and won. But in obesity, we've got a long, long, long way to go. And what I want to do is I just want to tell you the success story um, of coronary heart disease over the 20th century because this is a similar picture to the one we face in obesity, except the picture in obesity is only halfway there. So this is um, a mortality rate for cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease when we had the data over the 20th century. So this is um, an adjusted rate for how many people were dying from these conditions over this period of time. And this will look familiar to you now because this is what the obesity epidemic looks like. You get a dip at the start and then a rapid acceleration and then we haven't got here yet but there's a peak and then it begins to drop off really pretty quickly when you think, look at a picture like this of a 100 year period of time. And what happened is that something happened somewhere around 1960, 1965, 1970 where this turned around and the problem was solved. Um, there must be lessons in this for obesity. So if, if I was to ask you what was the magic bullet that turned these mortality rates around in about the mid-60s, what was it? What happened? Better treatments. Better treatments, thank you, Andy. Yes, better treatments, stents and so on, better drugs. What else? Exercise. More exercise, do you reckon? Yep. Okay, what else? That's it? Better drugs and a bit more exercise? <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else want to? Reducing smoking. I, I, I'm going to bet for reducing smoking. So let me, let, in fact, I'll show you it's, it's all manner of things. But this is tobacco consumption, cigarettes per adult over the same period of time. And what you can see is a concomitant sort of a pattern. So you can see a rapid increase in tobacco consumption to about the mid 60s, a plateauing like we saw, and then a reduction. And in fact, when you look at um, population attributable risk for the relationship between smoking and a heart attack, it's somewhere in around 90% of heart attacks are avoidable if there was a non-smoker. So smoking lifts that risk massively. So when we think about what... I'll try that again. <laughs> when we think about what's happened in Australia over that same period of time, these lines give you um, smoking rates for males and females 18 plus. This is Victoria. It's dropped from 35 down to about 15%. Uh, in men and for females from about 25% to about 10% over the same period of time. And what this picture shows is all of the different interventions that have happened over that period of time as that reduction in prevalence has happened. The point is that it is not one thing, it's not one treatment and it's not one social marketing campaign and it's not one piece of policy and it's not one piece of legislation. So you have bans in workplaces, you have pieces of legislation, nicotine replacement therapy, um, signal sorts of initiatives like the MCG being smoke three and so on and so on and so on. So over this period of time to turn the epidemic around and to turn smoking prevalence around, it required a whole bunch of different interventions at a whole bunch of levels. And I think this probably tells the story quite nicely. If I had have gone to the doctor in, in 1950, he would have been a chap and I would have sat down and he would have said, now, have a cigarette and tell me what the problem is. 
Now, that just seems ludicrous to us now. In fact, if we had have had this meeting 20 years ago, two-thirds of us would be smoking right now. Two-thirds of us would be halfway through a, um, a camel or a Winnie Blue. And, in fact, we look back on that, and that just seems absolutely ludicrous. And, and that's an example of what's called a paradigm shift in our public health thinking. If we think about what has to change to turn around the epidemic of non-communicable disease related to food and physical inactivity, causing obesity and, and, the, and the downstream effects of that, what are we going to look back on that we do now that just seems ridiculous? I think that's one of the big questions we really have to answer. One of the ways we're doing that is, is the Australian Heart Disease Statistics Program. So we've, we've got funding from the Australian Heart Foundation to specifically start looking at these disease trends over time and to start unpicking the relationships between the causes and the outcomes. So one of the problems we face is that policymakers are told, big problem, must do something, do something about causes of disease. And we have a lot of data available to us that we can't necessarily bring together. So co-funded with Deakin and with the Heart Foundation, we have an opportunity here to start building very large pictures of the ways in which these risks work in terms of um, population level disease rates and start looking at the natural experiments that are going on to understand how um, we're treating this problem. This is a terrible slide, and I'm sorry, but this, is, this explains the full Centre for Research Excellence. And I only want you to look at the yellow bit up the top, and it just shows the program of work. We're interested in um, scoping potential solutions and working out the economic credentials of those, understanding how priorities are set in policy and making policy process happen, understanding how policies have an impact and measuring that um, and how that's changing systems, and then monitoring that and changing it over time. 20 years ago, we would have had a conversation like this and we would have said, OK, we're going to focus on this one risk and we're going to target this one outcome. What we're doing now is we're saying we need to focus on a whole suite of risks, a whole suite of policy responses, and a whole suite of things between that policy through a system to the outcomes that we're interested in. Uh, essentially, this, this CRE is five years of funding to put all of those pieces together. And the other thing I'd like to mention is the co-ops collaboration. So all of what we've done has been built on the spirit of collaboration, of capacity building in communities, and of the solution probably growing out of community level action. The Co-ops Collaboration has existed since 2007. Um, it's a knowledge exchange engine which serves to bring the evidence base to practitioners working in obesity prevention in communities, but also to learn from them about what works, understand that in a meaningful way and share it back out. Um, I always get a bit excited about the membership, but I'm going to say there are 2,500 members and then my co-op staff are going to say, no, there's not there's only 2,000. But we have a huge number of members around the country who, who are helping us learn how better to do this, but also listening to us in terms of what needs to be done next. Um, and this just talks a little bit more about the co-ops um, program. One of the things I realised is, is that I don't Twitter and I don't um, Facebook and I don't blog. And in fact, one of the major ways that we're now reaching communities through the co-ops collaboration is through that, that sort of social media. And so um, we're having to rethink the way that the intervention is shared and the way that we share knowledge and share best practice. So I just want to finish by coming back to this particular picture. So what we've got is this clear picture of obesity prevalence jumping massively over the, um, over the second half of the 20th century. And when we looked at the causes of chronic disease, the major risk factors are unhealthy diet, physical inactivity and smoking. They're the major modifiable risks. You've seen that we've pretty much won the battle against smoking. So the two left are physical inactivity and unhealthy diet. And the key marker for that is obesity. So really the target here is those two risks and turning the obesity epidemic around and the flow on facts to chronic disease should be profound. If we think about this, this looks like we're at the start of or somewhere near the start of an epidemic curve like what we saw for cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease. And so this is that cigarette smoking and one of the questions is can we learn from what turned this around to turn the um, epidemic of obesity around? So at the minute we're here and we don't quite know where we are on this pattern. And the question is what it's going to take to turn this around either there, there or there. So that's a summary of our work, where we're up to what we're doing. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.